Good morning. We are live on the Falcons podcast. We're live on YouTube, but we want to bring in our Facebook page as well. That's Atlanta Falcons fans on all Falcons and Scott Kennedy sports. Those two combine for about 40,000 strong on Facebook. So if you're not there yet, check them out. Like to post some things there as well. Once we're ready, we'll get started and we are good. Welcome in everybody. It is a lovely Friday morning here in the Southeast. The rain looks like it may have pushed past us after soaking everything and waking all the pollen back up, rinsing some stuff off. And we are ready for a weekend. It means we are less than two weeks away from the NFL draft. This is the Falcons podcast. We go live on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Just a little programming note. Starting next week, this show will begin at 8.30 a.m. So we're going to try and make sure we feel like we cut our Monday morning show a little short. So we're going to start a little earlier so we can go a little longer. Nick will have to get up at 5.30. This was his idea. This was his idea. So he's out in Seattle. I am in Metro Atlanta up in Alpharetta Johns Creek area. Been uh, been here most of my life and looking forward to talking some Falcons football with y'all. We have uh, lots planned today. We're going to answer your questions. I set up a couple topics and then I read the chat. That's that's what we end up doing. We answer questions and have a, a Q&A on here. So couple of things I wanted to get into today. Uh, I don't feel like we really got into Mel Kuyper's mock draft very well on Wednesday. I want to get into that. Brian Baldinger coming out saying he had a premonition that the Falcons are taking a quarterback. We'll get into that. I got a couple of thoughts on that as well. Uh, and finally, we'll finish with the mock draft. Also, I was perusing around the, the net a little bit and saw some interesting questions like the most NFL's most underpaid player per team. I had a couple ideas on who that might be for the Falcons and, uh, it wasn't the one. It wasn't the first one that came to mind, but the choice that Bleacher Report came up with, I can't argue with that one either. So we go live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, starting next week at eight thirty. So uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you know when to get the alerts. And we go live because we like having the conversations with y'all. So welcome in everybody. I want to say hello to some folks that have had a chance to come in early, like Mikey Daniels. Mikey Daniels. Before we even got started, he says, "Good morning. Off work today." So getting to catch you live, well, it's flattering that you get to spend, that you want to spend some time with me in the morning. So I'm, I'm glad you're here. We're going to talk some uh, talk some football here. He's, uh, he says, love the content, always a great show. Well, I appreciate that. And it's it's because of people like you who not haven't necessarily even been here live, but are watching and liking on YouTube that we've really seen through the coaching change, through the quarterback change, through free agency, through the draft. The channel has really, it's its risen exponentially. It's doubled or tripled in size because of people like you, Mikey. So thank you very much. John Harrell, one of the OGs, he says, good morning, Scott and the Falcons crew. Live from Rockingham Dragway. Very nice. Get a video. Get a couple of videos of you racing. We'll show everybody. This is a community here. This is everybody. We'll, we'll show. I want to show John racing. It's very cool. My Swanker, good to see you. He says, what is the likelihood we draft a quarterback next year? And do you think Calais Campbell would come back for one last time? with or for the Atlanta Falcons. Do I think, uh, what is the likelihood we draft a quarterback next year? Good, very good. The uh, The Atlanta Falcons have one quarterback under contract. Who am I missing? Uh, Taylor Heineke, thank you. They, they still have Taylor Heineke. So they have to get another quarterback. They will get another quarterback. So within this cycle or next cycle, they will draft a quarterback. Now, will it be a premium pick? That's something I want to get into with, with Brian Balding, Baldinger said uh, he had a premonition the Atlanta Falcons were going to go quarterback at eight. Just something he was thinking about, basically rolling him back to, was it 2008, when the Falcons took Matt Ryan with a new coach, with Mike Smith, rel <laughs> relatively new ownership, excuse me, and setting the team up for the next 10, 15 years where you were set at quarterback. Now, I know there were some argument. I've seen some arguments on here uh, on the channel, some discussions like, well, you know, what did Matt Ryan actually win? Were you really set at quarterback? I'm like, Listen, you were set at quarterback. Matt Ryan was a pretty good quarterback. There were failings around him, uh, including from the general manager perspective, but you you really didn't have a big question. Can, is our quarterback good enough to win a game? Yeah, he is. Is the team around him good enough? Maybe not. So he thinks that, you know, new coach, new quarterback, something beyond, in, beyond uh, uh, Kirk Cousins who can mentor slash placehold while being a really good quarterback in his own right, he says quarterback, Atlanta Falcons. I disagree. <laughs> I disagree at eight. I've said I'll be absolutely flabbergasted, shocked 
if the Falcons go quarterback in the first round. Less shocked, but still very surprised if they take one in the second round. But shocked if they go. This team needs, needs to win. They need to win. The, 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 there's going to be a grace period where some excitement, you turn the team over, but you run the risk of apathy. And what's worse than anger is apathy. When you're mad, you care. When you don't care anymore, you've lost people. And it's real easy when someone goes off and says, you know what, I'm not watching anymore. I'm going to go fishing. Hey, I kind of like fishing. It's real easy to lose those people forever when you lose them once. So apathy is was is in danger of setting in with the Atlanta Falcons. New coach, free agency, all that stuff is going to give the team a boost. But they need to win, and they're not going to do that by spending a number eight overall pick on a guy that's not going to play. That's that's just not going to happen. I will be absolutely shocked if they go quarterback. Now, why might you do that? Why might we start getting that out there? Because if the Falcons want to trade down, they want a quarterback to be there at eight. Then they can start putting up a bidding war with the Broncos, with the Vikings, with the Raiders, some other teams that might be sneaky needs in there that might need a quarterback that you might not necessarily talk about at 11, 12, 13. I want a bidding war there. I want people talking Atlanta Falcons and quarterback all the way up until the draft. And maybe one of those big four slips to eight. And if it does, the Falcons can probably parlay another number one draft pick out of it. Coach, good to see you. Thank you for the super chat. He is getting us started, breaking the ice with the supers. He says, morning, y'all. He's got the coffee emoji. I'll drink to that. Here's my, my cup of Lion Coffee. Have a great show slash weekend. Appreciate it, Coach. It's better already. And I can't tell you how good it makes you feel when you log in. You hop on here and you already see the super chat in there. It's just, it, like I said before, it's humbling. It, it is. It really is. So thank you very much for the support, Coach. Looking forward to a good weekend. Two weeks until the draft. Baseball for me tonight. Doubleheader. Looking forward to that. So thank you very much for your support and your super chat over there on YouTube. Silas Draven, good to see you. Good morning, Scott and Nick. Everyone in the chat. Yep, Nick will be back on Monday. And again, we will be back at 8.30 starting on Monday for the uh, for the Falcons podcast. Red Swarm, happy Friday. Coffee, Scott, Nick, and all my friends in the chat. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Appreciate it. Roderick is over there uh, in, in Europe, across the pond. Good to see you as well. Afternoon, Scott, Nick, and everyone. I'll pass along all the well wishes to Nick as well. Jess Canaddy says, morning, Deacon Scott. Thank you, sir. My Swanker says, I, he follows back up. He says, what would be a shocker draft pick in this dra in this year's draft? For the Falcons, quarterback. That would shock me right now. Um, if you go, as far as the top guys that are concerned, there's not really anybody that can sneak in there that is a non-premium position that you start talking about that would be a shock. Like a tight end is still kind of a shock. A running back is still kind of a shock. A safety, even though I, I went for Kyle Hamilton, I, I was advocating for Kyle Hamilton with the Drake London pick two years ago. I thought he was a best prospect available, local guy, could be the face of the defense for a long time. Um, Kyle Hamilton as a safety is a little bit of a shock. So I think this is a much deeper draft than it was two years ago. And you start looking at the players that are available and you – there's not really anybody through the top 15 that would be okay if those guys went anywhere from 8 to 12. How surprising would it be? Now, there's supposed to be a big eight prospects as far as the top players involved, and they're all on offense. That's the thing. You got four quarterbacks, you got three wide receivers, and then offensive tackle Joe Alt. If one of those guys one of those guys will be available at eight because, you know, let's do the math, seven picks, there's one left. One of those offensive guys will be available at eight for the Atlanta Falcons. They're considered the top players in the draft. Do the Falcons really need a wide receiver? Kind of, but compared to edge rusher, compared to cornerback number two, those are significantly bigger needs. But if your board matches up where it says, all right, the wide receiver, I've got this wide receiver rated so much higher, and yes, I could use another wide receiver. The Falcons take wide receiver, it would be a surprise but not a shock. This is where we start talking on, um, this is where we start talking trade backs. And uh, Chase comes in, he asked me, he says, hey, Scott, did you watch Isaiah Williams at the Senior Bowl? 
I don't remember an Isaiah Williams. Was he a running back? I'd have to look back at my roster real quick, and it takes a second to boot up. Uh, let me check my – my. I probably even did video on him. I don't have Isaiah Williams video, so I haven't cut him up, which means I don't remember a ton about him, to be honest with you. So I'm sure I watched him. I just don't remember him. Isaiah Williams, that's James Williams, so he's on the national team. Obviously, he hasn't left much of an impression. <laughs> Williams, Evan Williams. I don't have an Isaiah Williams on my Senior Bowl roster. I just did a search on Williams, so if, if he was there, I don't really remember him. Apologies. So um, I'm going to say if he was there, I watched him, but I, I he didn't really leave an impression. Keith and Ellen Johnson, one of our supporters over on Facebook, he says, good morning, enjoying the show. We'll appreciate it. And Roderick Cook says, what about the Bears trading for Mahomes? The number one for Mahomes so they get a new quarterback. No, just a thought. That would qualify as a shock. Absolutely a shock. Jordan Brown, I can't wait to see what happens. We're officially young and hung from the coaches to the players. By the way, good morning. Good morning to you. Uh, Leonard Smitty Smith, another Smitty in here. Good to see you, Leonard. Good morning, Scott. Happy Friday. Thank you, sir. Brad Clark, uh, Oblivion Empire, Pac D, David. Gonna run through these here a little bit. Um, Harry Marshall Wood says, I got the logo tattoo. I'm here forever. I'll just complain a lot. Harry, good to see you in here. Appreciate it. Keith Brugman's in the house. He's over on Facebook as well. How many trades do you predict in the top 10? That is a great, great question, Keith. How many trades in the top 10? Do we want to say two? Two trades in the top 10. Arizona comes out and then possibly comes back in, depending on how far they go. So Arizona could be involved in two trades. We saw, uh, who did that before? Miami did that three years ago. Houston did that last year. I believe it was just last year they did that. Where a team trades down, like Arizona at four, comes back down, and then maybe trades back up. That said, I'd be pretty happy for the Falcons. The Falcons at eight are in a perfect position to move down a few spots. They just are. So over under at two and a half, how many trades in the top 10? Like we have said from the very beginning, like I have said from the very beginning for sure, I don't expect anything to happen in the top three. Those teams, there has been three quarterbacks. J.J. McCarthy has kind of elevated himself up into the top 10 discussion. There's been three quarterbacks that have been considered top 10 prospects, and the guys drafting one, two, and three all need quarterbacks. Trying to get one of those three position, three spots was going to be really, really tough. Arizona's open for business. For me, that's the team to watch. Uh, you know what else I like watching? Real quick, one of the things I want to, uh, you know what I like to talk about here is my coffee. So I'm drinking Lion Coffee. Uh, Lion Coffee is a, a great partner of the show now. Uh, Patrick Wiltsey reached out to me on on uh, one of the shows. Says, hey, anybody want some coffee? I'm like, sure, I do. And he's been sending us care packages for over a year. So uh, we have kind of formalized. We're now, they're an official partner of the Falcons podcast. And, you know, I am uh, not just a, a, a shill. <laughs> I am an advocate for Lion Coffee. So make sure the the... Make sure you give them a try. There's all kinds of different flavors, single serving, teas. Uh, if you go over to Hawaii, you can do, uh, they're, they're offering tours now. That would be a lot more interesting to me than taking a recovering alcoholic on a wine country trip, which happened several years ago. That was a painful day, by the way. And um, just great coffee, great company. And uh, they fuel our mornings here at the Falcons podcast, and I think you would really enjoy them too. So check them out at lioncoffee.com. Let's get back into this. Michael Ranquillo has found us over on Facebook. Michael usually comes over on YouTube. So let me bring up my Facebook groups here real quick. I don't want to miss out on anybody over there, which... Uh, Things a little bit different on StreamYard, just a little behind baseball. See, Michael Ronquillo is coming in with some big stars over on Facebook. So thank you very much. And uh, I didn't want to miss that you were supporting the show financially. Shows up a little easier on YouTube. And when I'm doing this solo, it's a little bit easier to see. That's why I look back and forth a lot. I want to check and make sure I'm not missing out on, on y'all when, when we do this. So thank you, Michael. 
Uh, certainly appreciate it with the stars and the support. Michael Sunrise Ron Keo. Jonathan says, have a great weekend. I hope you're here for a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna try and have a great weekend. Uh, Brian Greenleaf, good morning, Mr. Kennedy. Good morning to you, Mr. Greenleaf. Keith D. He says, good morning, Scott. QT medium roast for Lion and, and Walmart. No luck. Um, yeah, try, try just go direct to the source, lioncoffee.com. It's uh it's worth it. Um, and Chase says he was a receiver from Illinois, uh, with going back to the Isaiah Williams. I remember Keith Randolph from Illinois. I just I don't remember Isaiah Williams on this one. And he was at the shrine. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad I didn't make up a bunch of stuff then. <laughs> you know what they say? If you always um uh, you always tell the truth, you never have to remember what you say. I repeat myself a lot that way. So, but it's usually pretty consistent. Now, every once in a while, you may change an opinion after more information, but uh, I'll repeat myself a lot because always tell the truth. Always tell the truth. I'm like George Washington, right? Devron Beard is a great question. If Malik Neighbors is there at eight, I don't see us passing on him unless we get two firsts or a first and a second with a late pick added. Yeah, trading out of that. And it would be very tempting. And one of the questions I got early on about Terry Fontenot with some of my Saints friends and, you know, how do you think he's been doing? And I'm like, one of the first answers I always had was I would be really interested to know what he was offered for four with Kyle Pitts in a trade down scenario. Because so far, the Falcons trading back has been the way to go for several years in a row just because they need more players. They need more salary cap relief. They need more cost control, talented players, and trading back had been a great way to go. But get good players, you'll be a good team. And I think they've gotten good players with all three of their picks with Kyle Pitts, uh, Drake London, and Bajon Robinson. He doesn't trade, hasn't traded down once in three years. So if Malik Neighbors is there, or even if Roma Dunze is there, you might see him pick a wide receiver for sure. Tyler Eckel says, why is the Falcons' biggest draft needs been edge for years, but we never prioritize it? Can't watch Baker and Dobbs run for third and forever again. <laughs> Love the channel in the comments. It is. It's a great community, Tyler. Thank you for uh, thank you for being part of it. Um, the last couple of years, it's been tough. The problem is the, the freakiest of freak athletes in the NFL with the size-speed combination are – edge rushers you get a wide receiver every once in a while like calvin johnson who's 225 230 pounds and has that type but you go look up adafa always numbers go look up micah parsons numbers these guys are 250 pounds running in the in the four four sometimes less than them i think both of those guys went sub four four in their in their combine they're hard to find physically they're hard to find there hasn't really been the premium edge rusher available at eight or four for that matter, uh, in the last three picks. And then you see what they are getting paid. How are you going to get them in free agency when they don't leave? They don't leave very often. So I wonder what Brian Burns, if the Falcons, if the Panthers said, no, we're not trading him in division. No way. Forget it. We're not going to do it. Seeing Montez Sweat go to the Bears, he was available, but were the Falcons comfortable at giving him the next big contract, knowing that they probably planned on going after Kirk Cousins? Um, but you look at, uh, you know, who are the guy who, who just got the big deal? Josh Allen just got a $30 million deal, you know, three years guaranteed for 90, five for 50 with three years of that guaranteed. So it's hard. That's why Tyler... It's really hard to try and pass on one this year. There's there's just not the excuse to say, oh, that wasn't the right guy available when we were picking. Uh-uh. I'm not buying that this year, man. There's a couple of choices there, which means you can trade back, trade back some if you need to and, and get one of those guys. Now, will they pan out? Maybe. You know, if, if things had worked out, Vic Beasley could have been that guy for the last 10 years, but that was kind of a miss. So it hasn't been available the last several years, but it has been a sore spot forever. <laughs> it really has. When's Who's the last really good pass rusher the Atlanta Falcons drafted? Patrick Kearney in the 90s? God, I have to carry the one that's 30 years. You know, John, uh, Jonathan Abraham was really good. That was a trade. They used, I think they used a first-round draft pick on him. Vic Beasley had a flash, but as far as really good pass rusher, 
who's the who, who's one that they drafted and and really turned into the guy? Probably not anything in the modern era. It's been a while, so it's tough. No excuses this year. If they don't come out of this with a pass rusher, they better be able to come out of this with, oh, well, we got Malik Neighbors and we're just going to go out and score everybody. All right. I can, I can live with that. Winston Thornton, good to see you, my friend. This is good morning, Scott. With Arizona Cardinals in prime position to trade back and Vegas' owner signing off on trading up for a quarterback, if Arizona stays and gets a wide receiver, do you think we're the best trade partner for Vegas if they do move up? That's a really good question. Here's another team. The problem is there's another team up there that's kind of in a sneaky spot for needing a, uh, a a quarterback, and that's the New York Giants. They've got, and they're at six. So when you look at it, you say uh, Chicago Bears quarterback, Washington quarterback, New England quarterback, Arizona, Marvin Harrison Jr., or a trade back. L.A. Chargers, I think, might be the best team right there to trade back, but they're going to need a wide receiver. They, they've moved on from at least one, and the other ones, they're getting a little bit older and expensive, so I think they really want to stick and take one of those wide receivers. If somebody comes up for four and takes a quarterback, and Marvin Harrison Jr. falls to the, uh, I'm going to call him San Diego till I die, to the Chargers, that might work really well, but that means someone's going to keep falling. Watch six. Six might be in for a quarterback, and they might be in a trade. If they don't want a quarterback, they might be in the best position to trade. So I would watch as trade candidates, Cardinals, Giants, Falcons, and they're all evens, four, six, and eight. After that, you start talking about uh, Tennessee at seven. They could solidify. The Giants or the Titans could solidify their offensive line with Joe Alt. The Bears might want to try and get up ahead of Atlanta or even just with a pick swap and try and add a um, a number one receiver. So again, if you look at the Falcons' needs and the options there, it really, really matches up for a, uh, for a trade down, just a few spots. Uh, some more numbers coming in here. Drake Wally, look at Drake coming in. Thank you, Drake. I hope you're doing well. Speaking of new dads... So I uh, hope you were doing well with that. And uh, Drake comes in with the support over on YouTube with a super chat. He says, Falcons weapons like Bijan, London, and Mooney are going to love Kirk Cousins. Is this the year Pitts is unlocked? I think he was unlocked, so to speak, as a rookie because he had an accurate. I, I used to say, again, I've learned. You're learning. You're always evolving. I always like the bigger receivers because they're always open. You know, you can throw a bigger receiver open. And it's basically a rebound. But if you overthrow him, then you're no good. And if you underthrow him, you're no good. So you still have to be accurate in there. And, and Kyle Pitts, the last time he had an accurate quarterback was Matt Ryan. And he went for over 1,000 yards and was the, uh, what, the second rookie ever to do that behind Mike Ditka at tight end. So we know he's got it in him. And then he had Marcus Mariota, who isn't going to be in the same class of quarterback accuracy wise as Matt Ryan, Desmond Ritter, same thing. You know, the outside passing game was basically like, Oh, there's a matchup. We got a one V one. Let's just throw it up in the air. So I think Pitts coming back off of his injury can revert back to his rookie season form where he made some amazing catches looked like the weapon that he was drafted to be. We'll see. This is a year to do it. They'll pick up his fifth-year option. I haven't seen that that's already been done. I was out for a week, but I, I don't think that's already been done. It's only $10 million. They'll pick up his fifth-year option. This is his fourth year. He'll play on this one. They've got the ability. This year, if he doesn't, he might be available in a trade. So this is the year for him, Drake, Falcons fans. This is the year. This is with the Atlanta Falcons. I won't say make or break because he's still not overly expensive. And he's been okay. But to become the guy he was drafted to be this is the year this i i think this is the year for uh for for kyle pitts um there we go harry marshall wood says chuck smith is one of the better ones we drafted and that was a while ago i think i think chuck was before patrick kearney someone looked that one up for me but i think chuck smith was drafted before him um that's a um Good shout. Chuck Smith was a very good defensive end in a four-man front. And I think he was part of that. 
he was part of that uh, four man group in 1998. The the front four with Lester and was it Babineau, uh, Archambo, uh, Kearney, and Smith were those the four? Because those four were beasts, and they had like 40 sacks between them in a front four. It was what made that defense so dangerous when you could get pressure with a front four and drop seven in coverage. And they had a top five defense in that on that 98 team. So good shout, uh, Harry Marshall Wood. But I, I feel like he was drafted before Patrick Kearney. Not 100% on that one, though. Uh, Harry Marshall Wood, coming back, he says, what do you what do you think you can get from the Bears in a pick swap? To go from eight for nine, I think a third would probably do it, depending on what other teams are offering. You know, if... Um, if I'm on the phone, if I'm on the phone and the and I say, listen, the Vikings are sending me uh, 11 and 23 to come up to eight Chicago. They don't have a second round pick is one of the problems. Would you rather, you know, would you rather have 11 and 23 or would you rather have nine and a third? I think I'd rather have 11 and 23. Uh, you don't want pick eight going in division, do you? Going up to Skull Nation up there. So very, uh, very good. Uh, the, the Falcons are in a good spot. They're in a good spot with this one. And if they can get a, if they can get a, uh, a bidding war going for sure. Um, one of the, one of the things I wanted to talk about here is, uh, is, is Mel Kuyper's mock draft. And I don't think we hit that. And we won't, we won't, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on that this morning. Uh, the, the first pick for the Atlanta Falcons, I don't think we talked about it too much on Wednesday. The, uh, the first pick for the Atlanta Falcons was a very common one was Dallas Turner. And it's funny because the Atlanta Falcons pass rush improved a lot last year and it was still bad. <laughs> it was still last. They were last in the league in pass rush win rate at 31%. And as Mel Kuyper says, Atlanta's pass rush was abysmal last season. And it improved by like 50%. I don't think it quite doubled. But they had 18 sacks two years ago, and then they moved up to like 21 or 22. And I think they got close to 40 this year. They almost doubled, at least a 50% increase, and it was still bad. But he but uh, he thinks that Turner is the most well-rounded edge rusher, edge rusher in this class. He had 10 sacks last season and 22 and a half over three seasons at Alabama, and he can hold his own in the run game. That was one of the things I saw about him, is he's not just a pass rush specialist. Let me pour a little bit more coffee here. He's not just a pass rush specialist. He's he's a good edge. He's good at setting the edge. He's the number one you're looking for. I'm pretty... There's a reason why it makes sense. Best defensive prospect on the board. Huge need at pass rusher for the Falcons at eight. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and Tyler comes back. He says, you know, Claiborne, Babino, Jarrett prove they don't need an edge. It helps. You know, I don't like seeing Grady Jarrett triple teamed. It's what whatever you get from the interior line is gravy. That's why Grady's been so good. Gravy Grady. Maybe we can just give him a new nickname. He's been so good because he can get pressure from the inside. Typically, your your pressure needs to come from the outside. It's kind of like you feel like you're wasting Grady Jarrett having this weapon inside and nothing on the outside of him, you know, to really take advantage of him. Nothing's, you know, that's that's harsh, but how harsh is it really when you got Steven Means out there, you know, who hit two, had two quarterback hits in the season playing as a starter at edge? I mean, guys, we've seen, you know, miss blocking assignments where guys come in free and get a sack. That should happen at least once. So it was, uh, it was, I feel like we're wasting Grady Jarrett. He doesn't have much time left. I, I get the same feeling I did with, with him and, and Jesse Tuggle. Jesse toiled away on some bad teams and he was so good. Grady is so good and he does not get the credit he deserves because he's been on some bad teams. You know, what did he have? Like four sacks in the Super Bowl? If the Falcons are still playing at that level, this guy's getting mentioned as a Hall of Famer without a doubt. Problem is, he's been on a losing team ever since then. So there's a he, he needs some help, and he's got some. Anyamata is a great partner inside. Needs some edge help. Needs some uh, needs some edge help for that one. Uh, the King eighty three. Good to see you. It feels like a newer name. Appreciate you checking in. He says, Scott, what do you think of Jared Verse? I think he's the most balanced of all three pass rushers. 
Uh, I don't know Jared Verse as well as as I've watched um, Dallas Turner and, and a little bit of Leatu Latu. I so I wouldn't argue against him. You know, it, I know Nick likes Dallas Turner probably a little bit more than Jared Verse, but if if you were to tell me from what I've seen based on the numbers, size, you know, some brief highlights and stuff, I wouldn't argue against it. So I think that one becomes kind of a preference, and we've seen Jared Verse being picked there a lot. There's a lot of flexibility and and motion between those two seem to be, it seems to be those two and then Leatu Latu. So one and two is kind of interchangeable and then Leatu Latu. And then there's kind of a drop off to get down to someone like Chop Robinson. So I, I don't have any problem with Jared Verse. If he were the pick at eight, the edge, the pass rusher, I, I like the explosive numbers a little bit better for Dallas Turner, but that's, I'm not going to die on that hill for sure. Um, so good question. Beasley, he says, if Malik Neighbors is there, I'm taking him. It's tough to pass on. We've seen it happen. We'll do a mock draft here in a few minutes, and um, we will we'll see it. And, and Grady did set the Super Bowl sack record as a rookie. You know, And again, is he going to get three sacks a game? No. Is he one of the best interior linemen in the NFL? Yes. Is he the most underrated interior lineman in the NFL? Yes. Yes, he is. Uh, those are those are my opinions. So um, it doesn't mean I'm wrong. I might be biased. It does not mean I'm wrong. Moving down into the second round on Mel Kuyper Jr.'s, and this is on ESPN Plus, y'all. Um, I do subscribe to ESPN Plus mostly because I watch uh, – English soccer <laughs> and they've got a couple of the competitions in there, but Hey, they've combined it all. So you get your digital along with your video package on your Roku too. So little plug for ESPN plus I do subscribe and it's included with Verizon. So there you go. Uh, Atlanta Falcons, number 43, they take cornerback our cover boy for this video. Kamari Lassiter, uh, Kamari Lassiter, uh, competed in just a couple of the events at the NFL combine. But he was number one in one of my favorite drills, the Elcone at 662. 662 is flat out amazing. Uh, as far as running routes and covering guys, the Elcone for receivers and defensive backs is my absolute favorite drill to look at for your physical ability to either get separation or change direction and stay with a man. Uh, short move guys that are moving in shorter spaces, inside linebackers, uh, offensive and defensive linemen. I like the shuttle a little bit better, but the L cone is huge. And he was the number one Kamari Lasseter at five and 11 and a half, 186 pounds, 31 inch arms. Uh, it's funny. It says his athleticism, athleticism score is a 58 on his profile on NFL.com. That's because he only did. The uh, the three cone L cone still L cone in my head uh, at six six two was the number one number one for sure. So did a uh, he was uh, the top performer at the NFL Combine. Good size. I didn't watch him a ton at Georgia. Some of them, I know we got some Georgia fans in here. How would you feel? And if you're in the comments later on, how would you feel about taking Kamari Lassiter in the second round? There's definitely a need there at cornerback. So, uh, you know, would he fill that need opposite AJ Terrell? If you start looking at some of the guys that go after him, uh, Rakestraw out of Missouri, Malachi Corley, there's a wide receiver, Troy Franklin, a wide receiver. Jackson Powers Johnson seems to be slipping. And Nick said there's some injury concerns in there. It's got to be because he was fantastic at the Senior Bowl. And then he had to leave because of injury. So that might be a little scary. Chris Jenkins, defensive tackle. I've seen him taken. Roman Wilson at 49 of the Bengals. So when we get to the discussion about the wide receivers at eight, this is why I just have a hard time with it. This is why I had a hard time with Drake London knowing that George Pickens was going to be there in the second. Now, Pickens has some attitude concerns. I know, and he did. But boy, when he balls, he balls. Uh, you had Alex Pierce. Christian Watson was going to come out late. These guys in the second round, man, this is the draft for a second round receiver. You start talking about some of the guys in the second round. Keon Coleman was projected top 15 out of Florida State earlier this year. You go um, Ricky Pearsall, 
Kamari Lasseter had the number one L cone. Ricky Pearsall had the number two L cone, three cone. Uh, and his, his vertical jump was 42 inches, and he was the standout wide receiver at the Senior Bowl. Lad McConkey, another Senior Bowl guy. We all know about him at Georgia and, and his ability. His testing number proved that he's not just a high motor guy. He's, he's a really damn good athlete. Uh, go down just a little bit farther. Malachi Corley, 5'10", 220 pounds, built like a wide receiver. Drop him in the slots. So Troy Flank Franklin, another top-notch wide receiver out of uh, at 46. When we start talking about one of those wide receivers falling to eight, that's this is why I, I just I have a hard time getting on board there. Uh, if you could convince me that, hey, this is going to be a, a legit number one, this is a Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, okay, I'm listening. But you just took the number one wide receiver in the draft the year before. You took the number one receiver in the draft the year before that. Don't you kind of already have those guys? And if you don't think that, that you know, I can get my edge, then trade back. Trade back a little bit. Um, let me see here. On on uh, Xavier Leggett, there's a question here. It bounced on me a little bit. Wanted to hit on um, someone asked about Xavier Leggett. Sorry, Boss Boss Trucker asked about Xavier Leggett. Let me see where he went. I like Xavier Leggett. His his high, he's a he's a size guy. Reminds me a little bit of Jonathan Mingo last year, who went in the second round to the Panthers. And a little bit of Cordero Patterson with his size. Um, I don't remember. Let's see where he has him going. Xavier. Not worthy. Leggett. Xavier worthy. Leggett's 32 to the Chiefs is where he had him going. So another one of those first round wide receiver types. Another name that has snuck up into the first round that you guys have, if you're watching the show for the first time, you, you this would be new to you. But the name, if you're watching again, and we have a lot of repeat in here. Roger Rosengarten. How many times do we sneak him in in the third or fourth round or fifth round? He's in the first round of the offensive tackle from Washington. He is now in the first round of, of uh, Mel Kuyper's mock. Yeah, <laughs> I like him. You know, he's what, 6'6", 310 pounds and can move and has a good strong base. Yeah, what, what more are you looking for? Um, let me see here. I want to hit... Let me see here. Um, Keith Brugman says, why aren't wide, USC wide receivers ranked higher with Caleb Williams at quarterback? Well, one of them is top wide receiver went in the first round last year, Jordan Addison. And he was a transfer, was part of it. So they might be a little bit younger. He was only there. Was he there two years, three years? But he was a transfer. So they might not have recruited, you know, as well for guys that are draft eligible. I'd have to check the recruiting rankings, but they may have gone receiver um, as freshmen and then sophomores, and they wouldn't be draft eligible just yet. And that might be, you know, when you're in the middle of a coaching change, you're now getting the draft class from when the when USC was in turmoil and was in the process of a coaching change. That's why there's not more USC guys. Now, the next year, the first year of, of Caleb Williams being there, that that recruiting class, my instincts tell me, was probably pretty good was probably pretty good in there. Um, so, Kamari Lasseter, I don't know too much about him, again, compared to some of the wide receivers, but you look at the wide receivers on there, and it's it. that's why I don't want to, want to uh, necessarily take a wide receiver at number eight because there's so many good ones available in the second round. And if I'm going to move down, by God, I want another second-round pick to try and take advantage of how deep these are. Beasley says, uh, I really want Lad McConkey, but Falcons hate drafting Georgia players. They've taken a couple recently, lower, but yeah, there's been some really egregious errors in the past there. Uh, the Heinz Ward one was bad. I think would they take somebody out of, I don't even remember who it was now off the top of my head. It was, um, they took somebody out of the University of Miami ahead of Heinz Ward and just didn't work out. I know it made a lot of people bad last year um, with uh, with Jalen Carter there. That was my pick for what it's worth. Don't know if uh, you know if that pans out or ends up, but that's where I would have gone at eight. I do not hindsight grade. 
If you ask me what I would have done, I'll tell you if I would have missed badly. I would have taken Justin Fields at number two if I was a New York Jets. Right now, it ain't looking so good. So we will see. Uh, real quick, and then we're going to hop into a um, hop into a quick mock draft. Bleacher Report did a most underpaid player on every team. And I was like, well, there's going to be a lot of running backs in here. My first thought on this was uh, Tyler Algier. Was he going to be the most underpaid? Because, you know, he's a rookie record for the Atlanta Falcons. He did it in 16 games, I believe. So he actually won it fair and square. Yeah, because he was inactive the first year. How stupid was that? First game of the year, he was he was inactive. And you go in there with two running backs and Damian Harris gets hurt on his first carry. But Tyler Algier, his uh, base salary this year is 985000 He is a running back one for a lot of teams. They went with Nate Landman, and that is hard to argue against. Nate Landman had, he, what do you have, three or four recovered fumbles and uh, 110 tackles, and he didn't even start the whole season. Uh, and he's at $985,000 this year. So as far as most underpaid Falcons, there's some pretty good ones that are making, that are on good deals. The Falcons have drafted pretty well. So I have no arguments with Nate Landeman and Bleacher Report's pick on that one. My initial thought right away went to Tyler Algier. But yeah, I think Nate Landman was a really good pick. So what do y'all think? Uh, are you ready? Tyler says, if we get Turner at eight, uh, Tavondre Sweat at 43, that's arguably the best edge and defensive tackle in the draft. Yeah, for sure. I think Sweat's going to fall a little bit. I'm not sure people want it. I, I, I guess I said, I think the number for him is probably 40 to 55, but he may come down a little bit after, uh, after getting arrested for uh DUI, uh, last week, he may, he may fall a little bit into the sixties, seventies, eighties range. So, um, so we'll see on that one. And, and Nick pointed out that he was in, in the mock, one of the recent mocks, he was sent to the Denver Broncos. It's like, good luck in the altitude. You're worried about a 360 pound. You're worried about his wind and you're going to send him to uh to mile high. And that might be a little tough. Uh, Ryan Adonis. Good to see you, Ryan. He says, I could see us trading down and getting Byron Murphy, another interior lineman from Texas and edge chop Robinson from, uh, from Penn state. If we go corner early, then this is where we want to trade back into. So that's um, that's where we want to trade back into. Roderick Cook says wins. Uh, Bergeron, Dalman, misses Grant as far as uh, draft picks go. I saw most overpaid player, and I think Grady Jarrett was listed as the most overpaid player, and I, I disagree with that one. Even at just $4 million, I think Richie Grant, it goes to show that the Falcons are doing a pretty good job with their salary cap right now, that I, I think the most overpaid player might be Richie Grant at $4 million, which is good money for a safety. I don't, and I don't want to pay him $4 million. <laughs> so uh, it's Grady Jarrett if he's hurt and not playing. Yeah, well, then he's over. He's, he's not earning his money. But, you know, $20 million for an interior lineman of his caliber, that's about right. I can live with that one. Let me get one more question, and then I'm going to go get into a uh, into a um, mock draft if that's good with y'all. Winston, don't want to miss out on Winston. He says, "What do you think we will do with Anderson, after, uh, Troy Anderson, after the draft? If we don't take a linebacker, do we keep him at inside or move him where I think he would flourish at outside linebacker slash edge?" Winston, I think Caden Ellis was brought in to do some of that hybrid role inside outside up on the line of scrimmage and really move him around. I think Caden had seven ta seven sacks in 11 games with the Saints in 2022 before he moved over. He was forced to play more of a traditional inside linebacker and frankly had a good season. By the end of the year, he was really making flash plays from that inside linebacker position. You need three guys to play to man those two spots. I think you've got them. Landman, um, you've got Landman, Troy Anderson, and Caden Ellis. And I think you've got Lamin in there. You will be inside. This is your job. And then I think you can rotate and move the other guys around a little bit more. So that would be my uh, my prediction for how you use them. It's a little bit more of a wild card with Caden Ellis and Troy Anderson with Landman doing the, the blue collar work in there. Um, I'm going to hit a couple more questions here real quick. I you know love the questions. I hate to, to miss out on them. Ryan says, uh, Grady deserves his contract. Yes, he does. And he's 
earns it. It's not even just about the loyalty. He's he's really good. Jerry Mills says, hey, what's your opinion on the quarterbacks in this draft, on the quarterback position in this draft? I think, uh, let's see, I think Caleb Williams and Drake May are as good of quarterback prospects as we've seen since um, Trevor Lawrence. I think either one of those two guys would have gone number one in the last, including this one, the last three drafts, and then it would have been close with Trevor Lawrence a couple years ago. I think Jaden Daniels is an incredibly exciting prospect that would have been the number one quarterback in the last two drafts. Um, I really like J.J. McCarthy. I love his arm. I love the, his athleticism. I like how he throws on the run. It's an easy comp just to say, you know, oh, a Steve Young type, but he's he's really good. Uh, he's 21 years old. People say he didn't, didn't throw a ton, didn't have a lot of volume. They, they were undefeated. They won a national championship. The guys lost one game. I have no problems with how a coach uses his different players if he's winning. Why didn't you use him more? I didn't have to. We won, didn't we? So... I don't have any problem with that. What I've seen from him, I really like him. Bo Nix, to me, is a, a system guy. You, you've got to put him in a right system in a, in a short passing game for him to succeed, where the guys that you want to draft higher than that are system proof. You can put him in any type of system. You know, If I'm taking a guy in the top 15, I don't want to have to worry about scheme. They should be scheme independent. If they're not scheme independent, they're not good enough. So I don't necessarily want a Bo Nix that high. Michael Penix, I love his arm. I think he's a little bit more erratic as a thrower, but he's got an NFL caliber arm for sure, but his injury history scares me. He's missed, had like four season-ending injuries between his shoulder and his knees. That scares me a little bit. Uh, after that, I like Spencer Rattler as a day two guy. I think he, and then uh, Joe Milton, I kind of like as a wild card. This guy's got 105 mile an hour. He's Nuke Lelouch. You've got a 105 mile an hour fastball, and you're not sure what's gonna where it's gonna go. But he is six foot five, 250 pounds with a four, five, six, 40. He's athletic. I think he's Felipe Franks with a better arm. So let's see what happens with him. Those are my thoughts on a lot of the guys. Jordan Travis, Florida State. I don't know too much about him. Maybe a, a late day three type of flyer. I'm kind of out on Michael Pratt, but we'll see. We're out of two lanes. So it's a good class, Jerry. I think I think it's a really good class. Uh, Tyler Eckel says, "What are my thoughts on Braden Fisk? He seems underrated. He's top. He's he's gotten up into the top half of the second round. I think that's where he belongs. Uh, you know, the number one interior lineman got drafted there uh, a couple of years ago. Was it Bearmore to the Patriots? So the interior defensive tackles they don't get drafted as high, and he's a top fifty guy. Braden Fisk out of Florida State." has a tremendous get-off. He is so quick. He's baby Grady Jarrett. So that's what I think about him. What do y'all think? You ready to do a uh, do a quick mock draft on this one? I've already got it set up, so I hope you do. I've teased it. Let me see. Let me turn this one on over here. We're going to share screen, entire screen. We're going to get a mock draft on this one. I've got it a little bit slower so we can talk about doing some trades. The, 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 the turbo was way too fast. I've got it on seven rounds. We'll see if it's going too slow on that one. Public board, care for positional values about even, draft for needs about even, and randomness is about even. I got the Falcons picked here. Let's enter draft, and we're not going to make a trade. We're not going to try and trade up, so we'll let that one run. Okay, that's a decent speed to run. So you see the first seven guys, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy, Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison, Drake May, and, uh, and Fashanu. So, again, there's two guys that drop there, Roma Dunze and Joe Alt, that all of a sudden people are going to be clamoring to try and trade up for. If I trade down, I don't want to go all the way down to 20. If these are my options, 20, 30, 31, 33, I'm not interested. So we didn't get what we wanted here. And, yes, uh, I understand I can force trades. I don't like gaming the system. <laughs> I get that comment. You can just force the trades. I don't want to force the trades. I can't do that in real life. I want to see what is offered to me. So I'm not going to game the system and force a trade because ideally I'd like to trade right into here, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now let me see if I could get a second, a first round pick for the Steelers. If I could get their next year's number one, I'd consider it. They like that. So if I go to 20 and I get next year's number one, 
I don't want next year. I want another. Do I want another third? A second? Could I get a number third out of that? I'm gonna. It's gonna cost you for twenty. It's gonna cost you twenty, twenty five, one, and a third this year if I'm going all the way to twenty. All right. Well, let me throw in a pick swap. I'll throw in a six on that. And it they took it. So that was a trade down. That was a big trade down. That was a little bit farther than I really want to go. To be honest with you, uh, I could take Dallas Turner in here, but I'm gonna gamble that Leatu Latu is there. Chop Robinson is there. Now I've got another number one. I don't think the Falcons will trade back that far. I don't. I think they're going to want to go best player they can get to try and win now. So uh, I think they, they would trade back 10, 11, 12, 13 in this range. I don't think they would trade back that far. But the guys that were available, could I have taken Roman Dunze? I'd probably trade try and trade back a couple spots, but I would go to... Uh, I still want Dallas Turner in the spot. I'd be happy with Jared Burst in the spot. And we'll see if Leatu Latu. Alt Turner. There goes Turner at 10. Look at Graham Barton going up the trails. Murphy, Chop, Quinion, and Terry and Arnold. That means Leatu Latu has fallen to me. Or I could go, you know, the big uh, defensive tackle here. I want my edge. I do want my edge on this one. I know Brock Bowers is still there. That's a weapon you could use. But I think that's a little redundant with um i think that's a little redundant with um kyle pitts and drake london i'm reading the chat at the same time i gambled i win i'm taking layatsu latu at 20 i got another first rounder that i won't get to use this year but i got another third on that one see it slows down here a little bit so would y'all be okay with that if we came out of this draft on thursday night with layatsu latu at 20 is that something that you could live with knowing that I picked up a third and a 2025 first and I sent them back a you know 2025 six? Is that something that y'all would be happy with? I'd be pretty happy with that. Uh, again, I've said if I can get, I would have liked to have come back into the first and I probably could as uh, as Harry says, use our future first and, and uh, use our 2025. I've got two picks in the first to trade up. Harry, that starts getting a little confusing real quick, but yeah, that would have made sense to try and do that. Um, but you know what else I can do now? I've got two 2025s. Maybe I'm thinking quarterback in the future. Um, I could still consider that quarterback in the future. Chris asked, Scott, what do you think of Cedric Gray out of North Carolina? I thought he played well at the Senior Bowl this year. He did. Uh, it's just, it's really hard to get a feel for quarterbacks. I mean, for linebackers at the senior bowl and running backs are the two hardest positions to evaluate there. I like him. I don't know how much I like him. Linebackers are, you know, day three guys these days. So fourth, fifth round at linebacker there. I'd be okay with that. Um, we're back on the clock here. Bo Nix is still available at 43. TJ Tampa. I've got my corner here. Braden Fisk. We've talked about him. I'm not as high as Chris Braswell. Michael Penix, Roman Wilson. I love Roman Wilson. Kind of want my safety here. I love Ricky Pearsall. So it's hard for me to not go wide receiver here. I would probably try and go. I would probably try and go my wide receiver in this spot. I like Ricky Pearsall a little bit more than Roman Wilson. And I like that idea there. There's another edge here, but you know, Marshawn Nealon, he's coming up the boards. Kalen Polk, but I, I like I like four four of Ricky Pearsall with a forty two inch vertical leap. And I really like the wide receivers in the second round of this draft. I'm not going to pass here. I know safety is a big need. Cornerback two. If I really like those guys, you know, and TJ Tampa does have a first round grade on a lot of boards. I'm going to go corner here. I've talked myself right out of it, didn't I? So I'm a. Uh, I'm going uh, I'm going cornerback. I think that's what you need. It's definitely a need for sure. Jeremy, good morning. Says uh, stopping in and drop a like. I certainly appreciate it. Thanks for the support, my friend. We've got it slowed down a little bit. We may just go through the third round on this one, y'all. Uh, Braylon Trice. See, this is where it starts becoming interesting about quarterback. You know, I like Spencer Rattler. Can I go Spencer Rattler in this spot? I'd be okay with Spencer Rattler in the third. I've got two third round picks using one of them on a quarterback who's got some upside of a quarterback in the future for my third quarterback. I can live with that without a doubt. I've got some wide receivers here. Javon Baker is really good. I can go future offensive tackle. You guys have heard me talk about the, the uh, 
traits monster, Johnny Wilson. Johnny Wilson is six foot six, 240 pounds, just a tick under 240. Uh, and was four or five, I believe, at the combine and would look fluid. He looked, I know I, Florida State fans and people have watched him said he had trouble holding on to the ball in games. He looked really, really natural catching the ball uh, at Senior Bowl. Third round, I'd be okay with that one. This is a cornerback we take a lot when we do these. There's a running back, Malachi Corley, we've talked about. Running back, playing wide receiver, 5'10", 210 pounds. Braylon Trice, I don't mind here. Uh, I know I know that um, we might talk, and I can pick twice in a row here, so I might go two wide receivers. I might go Blake Fisher right here and go developmental offensive tackle. A little insurance at right tackle for Caleb McGarry wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. So I'm going to go uh, Harry Marshall Woods checking out. Great podcast, guys. Certainly appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for uh, spending the morning with us. What I really want is a safety in here. Cameron Kitchens, I like him. I'm going to go safety in this spot. Falcons need a safety. Let's go. There's some really good players in here. I could really, I could be happy with Johnny Wilson. I could be happy with Jamari Thrash. The wide receivers, again, why don't you want a wide receiver at eight? This is why, my God. There's going to be some, there's going to be some day two wide receivers. They're going to be pro bowlers. That's a promise. An absolute promise this year. So I'm going to go Cameron Kitchens. I'm going to try and fill a big need there at safety. We just got another third round pick, and I'm not passing up Johnny Wilson again. He is, again, traits monster with my third third round pick. I'm going that direction. Uh, let's let this run out. That is the first three picks. So we got, uh, it doesn't really show. Who you got? We can let this run out here real quick, and I'll, I'll talk with this. I'll answer some questions while this is going on. Daniel Mim says, uh, "Hey Scott, thanks for the Falcons channel. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you showing up." Chris Walker says, "I could live with that trade." Scott Latu worries me. Doesn't he have an injury history? Yeah, I think he had a neck problem. Was medically disqualified at Wisconsin and then cleared at UCLA and has played two years injury free. So that one's okay. The uh, I says I keep thinking about the Falcons draft and parade Jerry who had an injury history in college and wound up being of our worst first round draft picks ever. He was also really undersized. Uh, parade Jerry was a hell of a college player, but he was on the he was on the smaller side for an interior lineman, and I think he just couldn't quite cut it. Um, I uh, he his brother was huge. His brother John Jerry was an offensive tackle, and he was humongous. Uh, but Pare was a little bit shorter. So I'm okay with Latu and his, his injury history, but it is something to uh, to watch. To watch, pick 109. Uh, cheat code right here. We can go interior lineman Michael Hall Jr. Yes, we will. He's on my YouTube channel. Well, Senior Bowl guy, very quick player, interior lineman, uh, player I really like on this one. Um, let me see here. Jason Heller says, "What was TJ Tampa's L cone score?" Let me see if he has one. TJ Tampa. NFLC. Not everybody did those is one of the problems. So let me see if he competed in that. He did not. So I'd have to look up his uh, his pro day. He doesn't have TJ Tampa doesn't have uh, a com combine numbers on that one. So I don't know that one. Here's my safety. I already took one. I like Tyke Smith though. It is very good. I could get a special teams guy. I could get some help there. When I'm taking a bunch of kicks, uh, picks I'm going to have some redundancy. Makai Wingo, DL, solid pick. Kalen King is a guy who just really kind of fell. Y'all know I always like to go. Speaking of uh, traits monsters, <laughs> I'm going to line up six foot six, 260 pounds of Theo Johnson and six foot six, 240 pounds of, um, of Johnny Wilson. And I'm going to challenge somebody to like a field goal blocking contest. So, Theo Johnson's numbers athletically were off the charts at the combine. Let me read these to you. I just, I don't know how he keeps staying down there that low. I mean, the last time I saw something like this about really watching a player, Jimmy Graham, and he was coming out of basketball, and I'm just looking at his combine numbers. I'm like, draft this guy. He was six foot six, 259 pounds with a 4.5740, a 40 inch vertical leap, a 715 L cone, three cone. And a 419 shuttle. Good God. If he's in the South, he's probably a first round edge. 
uh, instead of a tight end. Now, this one becomes real interesting. Michael, how about Joe Milton? At Where are we in the sixth round? There's my third quarterback. There's my QB three right there. Six foot five again. When my when my draft class shows up, you're gonna know. <laughs> you're gonna know they are there. If I've got Johnny Wilson, Theo Johnson, and Joe Milton walk in the room, you're gonna know that they are there when you're looking for traits at that size. Um, Marcus Harris is a little he's he's a little bit like Michael Harris light. Um, this is where I start looking for uh Tanner, another guy who had awesome measurables. Backup center, possibly. He had the best. He had the best agility scores since I think it was Jason Kelsey, probably 15 years ago, and he looked good at the Senior Bowl too. So I'm pretty happy with this one. And I finish this draft. It's going to take a moment to finish out, but I finish this draft. I probably won't get the greatest grade in the world. I can live with that. Um, Michael Ranquillo is about ready to close us out. He says, great show today, Scott, on the Falcons podcast. Certainly appreciate it. Um, Tyler says, I love Joe Milton. He reminds me of Anthony Richardson. I, I don't think he's got quite the flexibility of Anthony Richardson, but he's, again, he's six foot five, 246 pounds, and was running four, five, six. I can live with that. I can live with that. And uh, Leon says, I also saw the Falcons brass went to see Michael Penix in person for a workout. And now Brian Baldinger is saying, I think the Falcons, I have this feeling that they're going to go quarterback in the draft. I think it's a smokescreen. I think they're trying to uh, to let people know that, hey, we're interested in quarterback. Come get our number eight pick and send us a number one to do it. So that's how we started this. We started this by trading back to 20 with the Steelers. The Steelers came up to, uh, came up to eight. And who'd they take? They took Roma Dunze. They they wanted to get another wide receiver. They took we passed on Roma Dunze, who turns into the next Jerry Rice, and Scott just got fired. But we got our edge, Leatu Latu at 20. We got a number a, a third that we used on Traits Monster, six foot six, 240 pounds of Johnny Wilson, wide receiver. And we got a future number one that we can spin into all kinds of different things. And we gave up a six in 2025, number eight to do it. I got my corner. TJ Tampa has some. First round grades on some boards, I got him at 43. PFF likes that one. I got my third tackle here in Blake Fisher. I got possibly my starting safety. We already mentioned Wilson. I got some really good depth here with Michael Hall, a defensive line who can deputize behind Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata and and um, Paquan Graham for that matter. I got Theo Johnson. I read his measurables a few minutes ago. If I'll be shocked if he's still available in the fifth. Joe Milton, a in the sixth round, a developmental quarterback with all kinds of tools, and then a really, really athletic center from Wisconsin. I'm pretty happy with this draft. I'd walk out of this draft thinking, let's cook. Uh, I'd feel pretty good about it. I mean, it is my draft, so I'm biased, obviously. Uh, but doesn't mean I'm wrong. So on that note, uh, I want to... Um, I want to make sure I got everybody on stars on Facebook. Michael came in twice. Thank you, my friend. And um, want to finish off here. Did I call him Joel Williams? Joe Milton? Did I call him Joel Williams? God, I hope I didn't. Um, I may have. When you're speaking fast and reading fast, I hope I didn't. Joe, apologies. Um, I like Joe Milton and as a day three. I think he's a really good pick. I want to say very special thank you to Lion Coffee. Check him out. I want to say thank you to Drake Wally, who came in. I want to say thank you to Michael Ranquillo, who came in with some stars twice. Thank you, my friend. And Coach, who kicked us off on this Friday. Thank you, Coach. Hope you all enjoyed the draft. Hope you all enjoyed the conversation. I have enjoyed the conversation with you all. I hope you have a terrific weekend. We will be back on Monday morning. Don't forget, set your clocks, subscribe and like so you get that alert. We'll be back at 8.30 a.m. Eastern on Monday. Until then... Y'all have a great weekend. Thanks for being here.